The jazz collector and scholar Sidney Anglo explores the legacy of the legendary Glaswegian jazzman Jamie McGee. I'm broken, ain't gonna die. I'm broken, I ain't gonna die. I'm broke, ain't gonna die. Everybody gets it hard just sometimes. I was standing on these Kero's feet one day. I was standing on these Kero's feet one day. Standing on each hero street one day. One die was all I had. Well, nigh all enthusiasts for the history of the blues and of jazz will be familiar with that artist and his music. Blind Lemon Jefferson, of course, and his one dime blues. But you wouldn't need the fingers of one hand to count those who might recognize this. I pay for blues as for a do. I pay for blues as for a do. I pay the blues, that's what I do. I pay the blues and the holler one or two. Everybody gets the blues sometime. Everybody gets the blues sometime. Everybody gets the blues sometime. So I bought a pipe and held myself a dime. That's Piping the Blues, performed by the extraordinary blues bagpiper One-Arm Jamie McGee and recorded in Atlanta around 1932 for FMF. The music is obviously modelled on Blind Lemon Jefferson's One Dime Blues, but it's magically transmuted by the unique suck, blow and holler technique devised by the emigre Scott. McGee's piping method defies analysis. Naturally, I have discussed the matter with a number of pipers, all of whom feel that much of what he does, in the way of simultaneous piping and singing, should be utterly impossible with two arms, let alone one. Yet his performances are well documented by many eyewitnesses, while he himself always claimed that his unique virtuosity was rooted in his early experiences, when, before he lost his left arm in the First World War, he had performed regularly as a one-man band on an almost incredible combination of instruments. Here he is talking about it to Otis Regrets, who recorded this conversation with him in a Dallas speakeasy in August 1952, when researching his classic study, The Emigre Hibernian Blues Men. Incidentally, the pianist you can hear in the background has been variously identified as Two Finger Johnson, Three Finger Schenectady Ted, or Four Finger Amos K. Gonzalez, all of whom were playing in Dallas at that time. A fact which makes one understand why the Basque mutant Gaston Pichigru, who had seven fingers on each hand, was generally regarded as the most formidably equipped musician of them all and was the envy of his colleagues. Oh, yes, son, I always played any number of instruments from when I was a little, little, barely a wee boy, wee boy, yes. I tell you, son, I used to play the one-man band in Glasgow sometimes 15 hours a day, sometimes 15 hours a night. Well, what did you play? Drums, cymbals, trumpet, that sort of thing? Drums, cymbals, trumpet, my good son, all of them. And the double bass and your mouth organ, your concertina, your Jew's heart all thrown in together. Oh, son, I made a hell of a noise. I tell you, I was famous. I was McGee the Boy Wonder. And after that, you see, you see, playing the old pipes with one arm was mere child's play. Child's play, I can tell you. Child's play? I doubt it. Even McGee's dazzling auto-polyphonic skills couldn't have encompassed the art of singing and piping simultaneously without a prodigious effort and unremitting practice. And this, I imagine, is why he liked to work with a guitar or piano to strengthen the sense of rhythmic continuity. He also developed what he himself called a kind of blue mumble, which was easier than singing while blowing the pipes. It gives the old lungs a wee rest, as he once explained. We can hear this mumble at the end of his weary haggis moan where, mingling with the pipe's drone, it provides an eerie epilogue to the almost unbearable sadness of the words. Ooh, ooh, I cannot keep from crying, no. Ooh, ooh, I cannot keep from crying, no. 
My poor weary haggis is a laying down and dying new. of Leadbelly's black snake moan is clear enough. But what isn't and never has been clear is just how McGee came to compose and perform in this way. The information we have about his life is exiguous and has mostly to be gleaned from a few provincial newspaper articles of the 1930s, some personal reminiscences included in the conversation with Otis Regrets, and one or two songs which begin with a sort of autobiographical recitative rather in the style of Leadbelly's account of his leaving home in Mr. Tom Hughes's town. McGee was born in Glasgow around 1885, grew up there and was apparently very well educated. But there was a wild streak in his makeup, and around the age of 17 he broke away from home and thereafter earned a precarious living as an itinerant street musician, which is how he honed his instrumental skills and learned to dodge missiles. He served as an infantryman in the Great War, where he failed to dodge the shell which cost him so dear, and it was immediately after the armistice that he decided to seek adventure, if not fortune, in the United States. All that we know of him for the next decade and a half is that he was traveling widely and constantly, drinking, singing, fighting, and whoring in bars and brothels from the Mississippi Delta and New Orleans up to Memphis and St. Louis, down again to Dallas, and then across to Georgia, where he spent some time in Atlanta and fell in with Aloysius Foulmouth Finkelstein, without doubt the most scatological scat singer of all time, whose language is said to have made even tough guys, such as the Mississippi blues man Robert Johnson and the Louisiana hog caller Cespit Haggerty Blanche. Foulmouth, unable to get anybody to record his constant stream of unmitigated filth, decided to form his own company and soon persuaded McGee to record with him. None of their joint performances have thus far turned up, but McGee did record a number of his own songs in three sessions for FMF between 1929 and 1933. Their technical quality leaves much to be desired, and as one contemporary critic contemptuously put it, they seem to have impressed on some kind of laminated cow dung. They're not really as bad as all that, and we've managed to clean them up, but it is a tremendous pity that the Lomaxes didn't include McGee in their great trawl of blues men. Perhaps by their time he'd already slipped into obscurity, or perhaps they just didn't consider him authentic enough. Yet, as a matter of fact, in blues terms, he'd studied in the very best schools. His extensive wanderings had made him familiar with a wide variety of styles, and he'd mingled with a host of famous musicians, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Lead Belly, Peg Leg Howell, and, most influential of all, the two Dumpling Brothers, Big Meat and Lil Apple. There was also a brief period when he fell under the not altogether healthy sway of brainy Frank Furzfenger, whose misguided attempts to intellectualize the blues resulted in such aberrations as the work song, Hegelian Triad Holler, and worse still, the truly appalling Relativity Blues. Good morning, Mr. Einstein, how do you do? Good morning, Mr. Einstein, how do you do? Why, I've increased mass by E over C to the power of two. Oh, good morning, Mr. 
for exile, how do you do? It was at this time that McGee tinkered about with various blue settings of poems by Burns and even the novels of Sir Walter Scott. But happily, Brainy Frank's experiments terminated abruptly in a brothel shootout and McGee quickly returned to the mainstream. He was in touch with James Cockermo Arnold, Bumblebee Slim and the Blind Blake, with the legendary Sleepy John Este, the even more legendary Holy Moses and the completely mythical Misha Ukulele Marchbanks. He actually worked with several of these artists, persuading them that his own bagpiping, suck, blow and holler could be a legitimate vehicle for the blues. And here's one fine example, McGee with Blind Lemon Meringue in the fascinating Wheezing Bag Blues, an impassioned lament occasioned, as the introduction to the song makes clear, by a rather nasty barroom brawl. <laughs> We're standing playing in the bar when this big fella starts making disparaging remarks about my kilt. And I says to him, you never seen a kilt before? And he says, only on pretty wee lasses, and I wasn't so pretty. But he lift up my kilt all the same to see what he could see. And he begins to lift up my kilt, and I says to him, I says to him, if you do that again, I'll melt you. And he does do it again. So I fetch him a crack in the sconce with my pipes and he pulls a knife from me and sticks it into me, as he thinks. And it would have done for me too, but it hits the old bag first and the leather takes most of the blow. So I kicks him in the ghoulies and his head comes forward and I jam the chanter into his mouth and damn near push his brains out through the top of his skull. But ever since then, the old pipes wheeze something dreadful. Now just you listen. To them wheeze, yeah. I got a hole in my back, babes, and it didn't blow true. I got a hole in my back, babes, and it didn't blow true. They wheeze and they whistle like the pipes should be too. Oh, mama, listen to those back, babes, wheeze. Oh, mama, listen to those bagpipes squeeze. Mama, they just squeak, no matter how I squeeze. Yeah. Ah, cover double, puncture in all in a patch. I done, 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 cover double, I done, puncture mama with an old leather patch. It's a nice wee bit leather, but the tartan doesn't match. Oh, just hear those bagpipes wheeze, man, they're wheezing new. Oh, wheeze, 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 wheeze. The guitar accompaniment here is specifically credited on the label to Blind Lemon Meringue, and it seems likely that Morang was also the guitarist in Black Pudding Moan, recorded at the same session, though not one of the surviving copies has its label. It used to be thought that the guitarist on that occasion was Gasping Gooch, because of the characteristic asthmatical wheeze which accompanies his attack on each chord. But it now seems certain that the wheeze is entirely due to McGee's punctured bagpipes. So much for circumstantial evidence. Songs like Wheezing Bag Blues and Black Pudding Moan, with its constant refrain, Ooh, ooh, my black pudding's run out of steam, remind us that for McGee, as for nearly every other blues artist, sex, or the lack of it, was a major preoccupation. It's blatant in the weary haggis moan we've already heard, and it's even more striking in the dried-up sporran shout, in which McGee's sensitive bagpipes are accompanied by some powerful piano playing, possibly by Alabama Slim, whose tragic career is well known, orphaned at the age of 10, earning a living playing in speakeasies, and dying a victim of drugs, booze, and loose women, burned out at the age of 17. On the other hand, some experts maintain that the pianist here is Alabama Fats, whose life followed a very different course when he became owner of a whole chain of brothels and graduated into legitimate real estate, winding up a multimillionaire and surviving into a sedate old age. 
Either way, the plank has a wonderful driving energy and serves as a perfect foil to the elegiac lyricism of McGee's pipe work. Incidentally, there's an amusing slip of the tongue in the first line when the eternal Scott forgets himself, perhaps deliberately, for just an instant. Oh, tell me, pray, dear lassie, I mean, mama, how come you don't do me no more like you done with me before? Oh, tell me, pray, dear mama, how come you don't do me no more like you done with me before? I had no love since 1904. Oh, pretty mama, I'm just going to sit right down and cry. The haunting combination of pipes, moaning, and the ineffable sadness of such songs captured the imagination of several writers during the mid-thirties, and Highland Mist by the Atlanta poet Plankton Lewis is typical. A misty landscape where the piper plays, a speakeasy, cheap liquor and smoke, not the banks and braes. The plaintive pipes, no pibroch moan, another land, a different muse, bag, chanter, and drone, and the aching poignancy of the blues. Nevertheless, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that despite the vein of sexual melancholy which runs through McGee's work, he was never an unhappy man. On the contrary, he seems to have been a wonderfully jovial personality, and although he entertained a nostalgic regard for certain aspects of the old country, which provided themes for many of his songs, stomping them down to the kilts, ice-cold porridge blues and the like, he was no sentimentalist and remained untainted by mawkish commercialism. McGee was a robust and wholly original blues man, and there's a memorable description of him by Otis Regrets. He was a huge fellow with a powerful constitution, fortified instead of being undermined by his addiction to strong liquors, strong cigars, and industrial quantities of thick, salted porridge. I can still see him standing like an oak tree in a kilt. His face, calling to mind that character in some Rex Stout novel, I forget which, with a complexion like a sunset preserved in alcohol puffing and blowing on his pipes, mumbling the blues and always, always smiling and laughing no matter how sad his song. A truly paradoxical and absolutely unique figure. The world of blues would be immeasurably the poorer without his list of recordings, though it is both short and rare. The shortest, rarest, and certainly the most bizarre item in McGee's recorded legacy is not, strictly speaking, a blues at all. Stomping the Porridge, in which he's joined by the tap-dancing scat singer Pegleg McTotter, guitarist Misha Marchbanks, and pianist Amos K. Gonzalez, is simply a fast and furious romp, very much in the style of Leadbelly's Eagle Rock Rag. The tune is interrupted when McTotter misses his footing in the middle of a particularly intricate series of steps, and the story got about that he was drunk and skidded out of control when he did literally stomp in a pool of spilled porridge. Both artists hotly denied this tale, but you can certainly hear the crash of the falling dancer followed by his frenzied curses, while McGee continues piping and hooting with laughter. Of course, this is not the aching poignancy of the blues, but what better way to end this tribute than with such a joyous and idiosyncratic sound? There's never been anything else quite like it. Stomping the porridge, the joyous and idiosyncratic sound of Peg Leg McTotter, tap, Misha Marchbanks, guitar, and Amos K. Gonzalez, piano, led by the inimitable Jamie One-Armed McGee on pipes. <laughs>